Good morning. I'm Kim McCoy Wade, Director of the California Department of Aging, and I'm thrilled to recognize, uh, rec <laughs> thrilled to welcome you, easy for me to say, to our webinar Wednesday. Uh, this is a very special topic and near and dear to my heart that we are focusing on today, poverty, hunger, and homelessness. And we once again have a lineup of amazing speakers from all across the state with all kinds of expertise to share the latest in this field and also importantly, hear from you. What is Webinar Wednesday? It is our weekly attempt to inform and engage you in what's happening in the Master Plan for Aging. Join us every Wednesday at this time in this place. They can always be found on our website. Don't need to register. They'll be recorded afterwards. So you can see and hear them again. And we welcome you watching them in groups and sharing them with friends and uh, live tweeting along with us. Today, as I mentioned, we are focusing on poverty, hunger, and homelessness. And I'm so delighted by the team we have assembled. First and foremost, after an introduction by me, we'll hear from Madeline Johnson, a counselor of elder member and senior advocate for hope and justice at St. Mary's Center. Followed by Alicia Sutton, deputy secretary for homelessness, a brand new position at the California Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. We're honored to have Dr. Margot Cruschel joining us fresh off the podium at another uh, a speech she's giving this morning. She'll be joining webinar Wednesday midstream and she is a professor of medicine at UCSF and director of the UCSF Center for Vulnerable Populations and of course the new Benioff initiative uh, on homelessness as well. We are delighted to have two of our members from our stakeholder advisory committee, both Janie Castillo, uh, the Seniors for Hope and Justice program coordinator at St. Mary's and Kevin Prindeville, Executive Director, Justice in Aging. Webinar Wednesdays are our chance to engage with you and hear from you your ideas for how we build a California that is age-friendly, disability-friendly, dementia-friendly. There's our calendar of what has been happening so far. This in many ways is our part two companion webinar to one we had just a couple weeks ago on housing, uh, which you can now see the video, the presentation and the transcript. But you also see we have a whole series on livable communities, a series on health and well-being, and a series on economic security and safety. Other issues on long-term services and supports are being addressed in a subcommittee that has a draft report coming soon. All information is at our new webpage, engageca.org, in English, Spanish, and Chinese. So with that invitation to join us, let's do some background on the master plan. As those of you who've been with us before and welcome to those of you who are new, uh, Governor Newsom has uh, issued an executive order in June of last year calling for creation of a master plan for aging. He tasked our health and human services secretary to convene both a cabinet level work group and a stakeholder advisory committee to develop this plan and release it October, 2020. Why did he do it? Uh, two reasons. Of course, his own personal experiences that many of us share, experiencing our own loved ones and family and friends and ourselves aging, and looking ahead to the future, looking at the data. California is aging. If you look at these uh, wonderful demographic charts, I love to hear them described as moving from pyramid to pillar. Uh, these charts on the bottom show people who are uh, at zero age and go up vertically all the way to 100, and on the left, uh, men and the right, women. And you can see back in the 1989, a high concentration of younger Californians, particularly that bump around the college and military age. Uh, but as you look forward to 2019 and 2049, more of us are living longer uh, while the birth rate is not increasing. And so we have a, a community and families that are changing in uh, how we age together and live together. Aging is changing in California. And one of the significant changes is the diversity. If you look at this uh, next chart, from our, our great friend and colleague, Dr. Stephen Wallace at UCLA, you can see that right now, the majority of elders are white, uh, but over time, the majority will become people of color, reflecting how the overall population of California has changed. And this is a little bit of a complicated chart, took me a second, but if you look at the left in terms of millions of people, you can see the, the bottom bar is uh, people who are white, and the left side shows that it's 2.663 million people over 65, and that grows not even quite double to 4.227 million by 2060. If you look at the top colored bar, green, uh, Latinos of any race, you'll see it's less than a million, 0.759, but by 2060, it goes by a factor of, let me do some quick math, eight almost, 5.522 million, 
a much more rapid growth. And overall, elders of color will move from being 38% in 2010 to 67% in 2060. So growing diversity. We also have uh, increasing poverty among older Californians, which is a particular focus today. And in poverty, like many things in California, also has health and social disparities uh, across race. And so if you look at this chart, you'll see that there are higher rates of poverty among groups, uh, particularly Latino and African American, by the time you combine the lower bar of, black, uh, of poor with the green bar above it of near poor, uh, over 40% of Latino and African Americans are facing poverty uh, as they age. Uh, Asian slightly lower uh, at closer to 30, 35%, and white uh, the lowest. Uh, American Indian up there with African American Latino above 40. Another thing to look at is the, the uh, we look at poverty and hunger and homelessness is the pressures on our living expenses. And one of the great tools that's been developed here in California by Professor Stephen Wallace is the Elder Index. And what's so wonderful about the poverty, the Elder Index is it moves us beyond just cash income to also look at expenses. And as we know in California, there are disparities across regions. One of the things that's interesting about the Elder Index and important is, is that it captures expenses. It looks at the, the way those expenses play out differently. So let's look at Los Angeles City in this chart. If you look at housing and compare that all the way across to Humboldt, you can see that, surprise, surprise, housing costs more uh, in Los Angeles City than Humboldt. So that is a real pressure in Los Angeles City. But let's go down three lines to healthcare. Los Angeles City, healthcare's 168. Humboldt County, 446, more expensive there. So in the end, as you go down your math, uh, the elder index per year ends up being very similar in Los Angeles and Humboldt between the combined pressures of housing and health. So while we always keep in mind these disparities across place and across race, and there's many, many more to, to, to keep in mind, that the bottom line is that aging is changing in California. We have more diversity, we have more people living alone, including but not only LGBTQ elders, more at risk of poverty, as we're going to talk more about today, but also opportunities as there's more awareness of the stages of aging. With all that background, here's the master plan framework to tackle it. We laid out a vision in line with our governor's vision of California for all across the lifespan, and we articulated the values that drive this plan. Choices for all of us, equity, dignity and anti-ageism and anti-bias and disability and other biases, inclusion and accessibility for all, both innovation, trying new things, and learning from our, our past and our evidence, and uh, throughout all of this strong partnerships, aging is all of us in all places. We have a mission to deliver a person-centered, data-driven, 10-year California master plan for aging by October with a state plan, a local blueprint, a data dashboard with state and local data, and best practice resources for local planning, all of which we help you have a toolkit to enhance or advance your own local, state, your own local aging plan, which of course ultimately drives how California does. We've bucketed the work into four big goals that reflect how uh, we all want to age. We all want services and support so we can live where we choose as we age and have the help we and our families need to do so. We want livable communities and purpose we will live in and be engaged in communities that are age friendly, dementia friendly, disability friendly. Health and well being. We will live in communities and have access to services and care that optimize health and quality of life. And today's focus, economic security and safety. We will have economic security and be safe from abuse, neglect, exploitation, and natural disasters and emergencies throughout our lives. Given that vision, mission, values, and goals, here's our timeline and here's where we are. We launched in June, began meeting in August. This fall and winter, we are spending developing ideas, hearing from you in so many forums, online, in communities, across the state, and here at Webinar Wednesdays. Coming soon is the March stakeholder report on LTSS. The summer will be bringing it all together in one synthesis and then heading to that October release. Very excited to be in this journey with you all. With that, I'm going to turn to the topic before us on poverty and nutrition. And I want to remind you that we are running some polls throughout. One of the key ways that we interact with you all is through polling and commenting and chatting. 
So uh, we start our polls every week by finding out who's here. So please take a moment if you haven't already to be responding to those polls of who's here and watch for those throughout the presentation and we will let you know uh, what we see at our next uh, break. So I'm gonna take a second to just ground us in some of the poverty and nutrition programs that are provided in California uh, before we do our deep dive on homelessness with, with our esteemed panel of experts. Uh, as many of you know, this is my background and I'm thrilled to be sharing the work of my uh, former colleagues uh, in this area. The Bedrock Program for, uh, to Fight Poverty for Low-Income Adults and Adults with Disabilities is the SSI program. The SSI program, Supplemental Security Income, is our primary cash assistance program. 1.2 million Californians receive it each month. It is a federal program, of course, with federal determinations, but the state, CDSS is the partner department. Uh, and uniquely, uh, not uniquely, but importantly in California, we also have a state supplemental payment, an SSP uh, to supplement that payment as the name suggests. And you see on the slide, the payments, the maximum payment amounts, $943 for individuals per month and $1,582 for couples. California also, in addition to SSP, also has a uh, complementary program on the next slide called CAPI, uh, not to go too deep into acronyms, but Cash Assistance Program for Immigrants. This is to provide basically SSI for folks who are not federally eligible. Again, uh, part of our California for All values. There are some other cash assistance programs that are important, veterans uh, and others, uh, but these are two, the, the SSI program really is the bedrock of the California Anti-Poverty Cash Assistance Program. Also wanna highlight another California uh, unique, uh, unique uh, anti-poverty effort is through the tax credits. Uh, California does have a state earned income tax credit to supplement the federal, and we are the only state where workers 65 and over can claim the EITC, and those workers cannot claim the federal EITC. So we are the only place where low-income workers 65 and over. And again, as we heard on our second webinar Wednesday, more and more people over 65 are choosing to work for either purpose reasons or, of course, out of economic necessity. And just a reminder, there's many children's, children's tax credits that often are about uh, uh, who's the caregiver. And so there are grandparents who can also claim many of the credits, including the state's new young child tax credit. So I commend to you Cal EITC for me and thank our partners at the Community Services and Development Department for their leadership of these programs and outreach efforts. Next, nutrition. CalFresh, uh, the big headlines for older adults and people with disabilities, of course, was the expansion of CalFresh. Some of you may know it by the federal name SNAP. Some of you may know it by its longstanding popular name, Food Stamps. But CalFresh is what we call it in California. And uh, last summer, for the first time, uh, CalFresh food was available, became available to people who were receiving SSI and SSP. So it, it kicked off with a bang last June. Uh, lots of information at CalFresh food, lots of outreach partners, including here with my department, uh, CDA, and AAAs across the state, as well as independent living centers in the Department of Rehabilitation and regional centers in the Department of um, Developmental Services. So through those partnerships with many, many others, I'm the next slide you can see that since last June through December, into seven months of work, 400,000 SSI recipients uh, are now receiving CalFresh food. Uh, anywhere, it could be a minimum of $16 a month, but many folks are averaging closer to $7,500 a month in food benefits on a card, EBT card, that they can use for grocery shopping. So that's been a huge change in the nutrition support for older adults and people with disabilities. And of course, the last thing I'll mention before turning it over is there are many other nutrition programs that are critical to older Californians and people with disabilities. There are home delivered meals that we oversee. Uh, many of you may know of Meals on Wheels, uh, and, but there are other uh, versions of that. In a, in a parallel program, uh, congregate meals or community meals that might be served at a senior center. Uh, there's also, you may not know this, but the California Department of Education oversees an older uh, adult nutrition program because they oversee the child and adult care food program. So many adult day centers are serving meals in partnership with this program. Food banks are giving out commodity supplemental food programs. These are uh, specifically nutritiously prescribed boxes of food uh, for older adults. And of course, we're grateful to our partnership with the Department of Food and Ag for Seniors Farmers Market Nutrition to, to boost nutrition, uh, community engagement, and of course, local agriculture. 
and Department of Healthcare Services has been innovative in uh, looking at medically tailored meals as part of healthcare, uh, food as medicine, and a broader approach. On the next slide, I want to uh, commend the California food policy advocates who uh, convened this, this, this crowded uh, but collaborative field of, of, of food leaders in this space for a food and dignity and aging convening in November, kicking off a new era of coordination and collaboration and planning to think about how we strengthen nutrition access and health for older adults and people with disabilities. So that was a quick uh, 101 on, on poverty and nutrition before we turn to uh, homelessness. Um, let's check in with uh, Adam Willoughby, our CDA Director of Communications, and hear who is with us this morning. Great, thank you so much, Kim, and thank you to everyone on this webinar for uh, your um, very high rate of participation in the polls that we asked you. We asked you, uh, we asked you four questions, uh, and I'm going to uh, report out on those. So the first question that we asked you, are you an interested member of the public or employed in fields providing services or programs to address poverty, hunger, or homelessness? Um, both coming in at 36%, uh, folks indicated that they are uh, an interested member of the public. Uh, and uh, equally at 36%, folks indicated that they are employed in fields providing services or programs addressing more than one. Uh, and then we ask you to tell us in the chat box uh, what those are. And then uh, coming in at 14%, people indicated that they are employed in fields providing services and programs to address hunger. So thank you for uh, providing that feedback, uh, very important feedback. The next question that we asked, we asked, what age group do you belong to? Uh, and so it looks like 25% of folks indicated that they are in the age range of 55 to 64. Uh, the next highest at 19% uh, respondents indicated that they are in the range of 25 to 34. And then uh, coming in at 17%, uh, there were two groups, uh, 35 to 44 and 45 to 54. And then the third question that we asked, where do you live in California? So it looks like uh, coming in at 30%, folks indicated that they live in the Sacramento region. Uh, coming in at second place, 22% uh, respondents indicated they are uh, calling in from the Bay Area. And then uh, Los Angeles is coming in uh, third place at 19%. So thank you very much for uh, responding to those polls. And we looks like we have one final one that we asked you. We asked you uh, a question about your experience with uh, nutrition security. Uh, and, and so um, looks like 41% of folks indicated that they uh, uh, have bought food that didn't last. 18% uh, of folks have uh, cut your meal size or skipped a meal. 13% of individuals indicated that they were worried that they would run out of food. And uh, let's see, finally at 15% uh, folks indicated that they could not afford balanced meals. So thank you very much for responding to those polls and please be looking for uh, additional polls as this webinar continues. And thank you for sharing your experience with food and hunger and, and uh, food insecurity. That's what exactly what we are here to talk about uh, is poverty, hunger, and homelessness. And so I am honored to be able to hand it over to our stakeholder advisory committee member and, and champion, Janie Castillo of St. Mary's Center and Ms. Madeline Johnson to share about the services for older adults and a personal story about homelessness. Janie? Checking, you are unmuted, Bob. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can, Janie. Oh, perfect, thank you. Um, once again, thank you, Director Wade and the wonderful folks who helped put these webinars together. And thanks to all who took the time to be with us today. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about St. Mary's Center. St. Mary's Center is a senior service provider located in the 
disadvantaged area of West Oakland, our first priority is direct service to approximately 1,000 housed and unhoused seniors each year. Most, if not all, live in, live in deep poverty, including homelessness. We provide case management, health care referrals, money management services. We also offer food programs like Mercy Brown Bags, Spectremont Lunches, and we depend on volunteer group donors like the Muffin People to drop off carloads of groceries to help address senior and family hunger. We also have a wonderful community center where seniors come for companionship and a mean game of dominoes. Next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. Here's a look at our facilities. You may be surprised that we serve babies as well as seniors. We have a preschool for low-income families and an emergency winter shelter that serves persons over 55 years old. Across three buildings, we have 41 units of transitional housing, and we are in the early stages of building 68 units of senior affordable housing across the street from the main site. Next slide, please. So we have been in the field since 1972, and like every major city, these last five years, we have seen a significant increase in homelessness, particularly within the senior population. St. Mary's Center responded to the crisis by opening our winter shelter two weeks early and facilitating a weekly housing clinic whose only purpose is to find housing leads and help seniors turn in um, applications. Uh, we believe that in the current housing environment where seniors wait years for subsidized housing, each senior needs to submit at least 35 good applications to get into housing within two years. This is not easy, but we work hard in partnership with our seniors to make it happen. Um, next slide, I think. No, this should be it. I think you're okay. So uh, St. Mary's Center has two programs that work side by side. One is homeless services and the other is resources for the third age. In simple terms, because it is actually quite complicated, RTA helps seniors stay housed, connects them to resources, helping unhoused seniors transition from homelessness to housing, staying with them as they age in place. For those whose health declines, we help them access in-home support services, board and care homes, assisted living units, we are with them in their final transition, even helping family members navigate the end of life. The Hope and Justice Program is another program I am most proud of, where seniors engage in social justice activities to improve quality of life for themselves and their peers. You may have seen us in Sacramento speaking up for SSI grant restoration, uh, the CalFresh expansion, and of course, affordable housing. Solutions that work best include the ideas and experience of those most impacted. I'd like to direct you to a report by All Together in Dignity called Push to the Bottom. I'll put a link in the chat box that describes the true impact of poverty from the perspective of those living it. I really wish I had an hour just to talk about this report. It's that important. We have a core group of seniors who use their experience to inspire and educate our policymakers. One of those seniors is here today, and it is my privilege to introduce Senior Advocate for Hope and Justice, Mental Health Advocate and Council of Elder Member, Madeline Johnson. Next slide, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Madeline Johnson. I am grateful for the opportunity to share some of my experience with homelessness. I am a disabled senior who has been a wheelchair user since 2003. During the winter of 2013, I suffered an emotional crisis that forced me out of my son's home into my car. It was very uncomfortable and scary. Several years prior to my son witnessed the violent death of his older brother. The incident left him traumatized and withdrawn. I was also traumatized with deep feelings of grief. It was difficult to understand and support the son that was left while grieving for the one that I lost. Depress depression set in while we, were tr while we tried to heal, but the pain of our lives became unbearable. We were not able to speak about the incident and how it affected us. For a while, my grandson 
kept our family together because we needed to be strong to take care of him. Eventually, the frustration and the arguments drew me out of the house and into my car. I felt exposed living outside. It is hard to describe how bad it feels to be without a bathroom or water. I could not clean up when I wanted to, which made me feel unkept. I did not eat well. My health and my depression got worse. Living out of my car was humiliating. It was an humiliating experience. I parked my son. I parked outside of my son's apartment because I felt safer there. My grandson would pass by my car on the school on the way to school to stop to say hello and give me a hug. Every once in a while, neighbors would bring me care packages filled with food, tea, and sometimes money. I was overwhelmed with mixed feelings of gratitude and embarrassment. The gifts touched me deeply. One was a thermos, and another was fresh fruit, fruit, among others. It was good to know that people cared about me. I did not try to. I did try to stay at several emergency shelters. One that was an ADA. It was hard to maneuver the bathroom at night. I had to set up. I had to sleep setting up in my wheelchair because I could not use a cot. I had a cot break down on me at another shelter, and I did not want to fall again. It was very cold, making it difficult to get out of the shelter on time. I suffer from chronic arthritis. My pain makes it difficult to move in the cold. My pain medication slowed me down and made me sleepy, which did not help. I make about $1,000 a month, which means I'm in need of deeply affordable housing. When I became homeless, I had no idea what services were available or where to go to access them. I had to painfully learn how the system worked. I fell into deep depression, running around looking for help. I learned there were many other seniors in the same or worse situation, all in need of housing and food. But most of all, we needed someone to help us navigate a system that was not senior friendly. And now in the same marriage transitional house where I'm so grateful to be inside and safe where I can wait for affordable housing. It has also given me a chance to rebuild and restructure my life. I have been putting in applications for four years. Finally, last winter, I learned I'm at the top of the waiting list for a senior apartment. If it goes well, I hope to have a permanent home soon. <clears throat> I would like the governor to consider creating a system that automatically sheds resources to seniors in crisis. Right now, the best way to find services is word of mouth. I also believe we need to have emergency shelters that consider the needs of seniors with mobility issues. As an advocate, it is really important to raise the grant for SSI recipients. And of course, we need to create affordable housing for seniors who make less than a thousand dollars a month. Thank you for allowing me to share some of my story. Back to you, uh, Director Wade. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, and thank you, Janie Castillo, uh, for sharing your story with the master plan, with all of us who are here to do exactly what you were calling us to do. To, to end the crisis of homelessness, to house all of Californians. We are grateful for your leadership and your passion and your advocacy. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Allie Sutton, California's first Deputy Secretary for Homelessness. Allie. We are unmuting you, and can you hear us? <laughs> I can hear you, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Great, um, well I also wanna just uh, thank Ms. Johnson for um, for sharing that story, those, those aren't easy to share, but they're so important for folks to understand sort of the, the full scope of what we're trying to, trying to address here. Um, so I, a little bit about um, 
myself quickly and our and our team before diving into some of the work that um, the governor is in the midst of doing uh, with our support. Um, so. The California Homeless and Coordinating Financing Council, for those of you who don't know, is sort of a, a growing team, um, and we support and oversee the, the council of 19 governor-appointed members representing state departments um, that have housing and homelessness-related programs, as well as representatives from local governments, Homelessness Continuums of Care, um, which is a, an, an entity that um, receives uh, funding from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and is in local communities across the state, um, as well as providers and individuals with lived experience. Um, the team is also responsible for the development and implementation of the $500 million Homeless Emergency Aid Program and the $650 million Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Program, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about here in a, in a second. Um, next slide. So Dr. Kushel, um, who you all will be hearing about, hearing from in a, in a little bit here, um, is probably going to give you a, quite a bit more information and, and detail around the aging homeless population and the data that we have on that. But I also just wanted to put that into context a little bit um, for the broader challenges that our state is trying to address around homelessness right now. Um, so for those of you that, that may have heard, the, um, these homeless continuums of care are required to do what, what the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development calls a point-in-time count every January. Um, and so the, the data from that just recently was released for last January uh, 2019. Um, and we have found that there were, at that point in time, um, 151,278 Californians, Californians who were identified as homeless. Um, these statistics are not perfect by any means. There's lots of experts that have questions about the method methodology and it, this likely underestimates the number, particularly the number of unsheltered um, individuals that we have in our state. Um, and across the course of a year, we sort of believe that this number is probably two to three times higher over the course of a, of a calendar year. So that's just sort of a point in time, but the, the, the challenges are, are much greater throughout the, the year. Um, we also have a significantly disproportionate share of the homeless population across the country. So California represents 12% of the nation's population, but 27% of our homeless population. Um, we also see significant disproportionality amongst African American homelessness in California. Roughly 30% of the state's unhoused population is black. 6.5% um, of our general population is black. Um, so some significant concerns there that we're trying to, to think more, more critically about in some of our policies. Um, and our numbers are going up, which is not a shock for anybody who lives anywhere in the state. Um, we've been experienced a 16% increase in homelessness from 2018 and an even greater increase of 21% in unsheltered homelessness over the course of last year. So we really, um, it is not a surprise. There's a lot of information uh, to suggest that this is the number one issue for Californians in the state, and we are we are feeling that and, and doing our very best to address that um, with some of the, the efforts the governor has put into place in the last year and a half. Next slide. So just a little bit, um, sort of more recently, what has been been going on. Um, so the governor has really attempted to do uh, put everything on the table. Um, no, leave no stone unturned mo model, and that is really very clear with the executive order he signed earlier in January, on, on January 8th. Um, this executive order did many things, but it also inc it specifically included taking action to rapidly increase shelter options for our homeless neighbors. As we mentioned, we've seen a significant increase in unsheltered homelessness, and this executive order was really intended to, to try to address that, that crucial and critical emergency need. Um, so some of the things that, that were included in that, we, the state has offered up 100 state-owned trailers um, that have been sitting dormant from, from prior use in, in some of our, our fires across the, across the last couple of years, putting those out as surplus for, for communities to, to offer for emergency shelter for individuals and families. There, he also required state agencies to scan for possible excess state land that could be used for emergency shelters. We're in the midst of pulling that list together and making that public here quite soon. Um, that could be both used by local partners, sort of cities, communities, COCs, uh, to provide shelters for individuals who are homeless. It also has um, a, a state, state level, what we're calling a strike team, um, for communities that are having 
difficulty sort of addressing specific things they think the state agencies or government could address that we are, are committed to doing and moving quickly on those requests and trying to, to break down barriers to services wherever possible. The governor also appointed a Council on Regional Advisors, um, which is co-chaired by Sacramento Mayor Daryl Steinberg and LA Supervisor Mark Ridley-Thomas. Um, the council recently came out with a list of recommendations that the governor's office is reviewing, but really trying to get as many smart folks thinking about this incredibly difficult challenge as possible. And so some really important work and conversation happening out of that council as well. Um, and then as Kim mentioned, we are, we, um, the administration has also provided leadership at the state level in terms of staffing. So my role as the Deputy Secretary for Homeless is brand new um, and is really intended to, to focus on state coordination and the, and the state funding that is coming out to be used most effective, effectively and efficiently. Um, and he has also announced Jason Elliott recently as a senior counselor to the governor on housing and homelessness. So um, those two roles and then also something we've been really thrilled about um, he has brought on the former U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, um, the Executive Director Matthew Doherty as an advisor, both to state agencies and to the governor. So really trying to bring the, the best minds on this issue and, and try to help solve it, knowing that it's going to take a collective effort of, of innovation and expertise to, to get this done. Uh, next slide. Amy. So those are sort of some, some of the, the non-funding type things, but I know folks really like to talk about the funding as well. And it's important to note that we put quite a bit of money into this effort in the last few years. Um, so as I mentioned, um, two years ago under, under Governor Brown, uh, there was a, a, an emergency fund of $500 million that was really intended to get out to communities as quickly as possible to really address urgent emergency needs. The governor last year um, in his budget, there was about a billion dollars in funding to fight homelessness, which included $650 million in emergency homelessness aid, but that is sort of more specifically targeted at both unsheltered, but also getting folks into permanent housing solutions. Um, the, what we lovingly, we love our acronyms in state government. <laughs> um, so what we lovingly recall HAP um, has been made available to local jurisdictions, city, uh, the 13 largest cities, all counties and the 44 continuums of care to support regional coordination um, and to help expand local capacity to address our, our homelessness challenges. The funding can be spent on a really broad range of evidence-based uh, funding streams, including rental assistance, security deposits, outreach and coordination, um, system support to ensure that this funding is being used most effectively, and really thinking through innovative housing solutions. We know that we don't have all the answers on how to address this problem today. And so really trying to provide some flexibility in this funding for, for local communities to try out new things and see if there's, there's solutions that we haven't, haven't tried yet that have really great success. Um, that funding is also uh, focused on prevention and shelter diversion. So really trying to, as I think Margot will talk a little bit about, if I know her well enough, <laughs> um, around trying to, to sort of catch folks before they fall into homelessness, knowing that um, there's a crucial moment we can, we can um, engage with folks before they become homeless uh, to prevent that sort of traumatic experience happening in the, in the first place. And then this year in the budget, um, the governor has proposed an additional billion dollars in funding, which includes an additional $750 million for this new California Access to Housing and Services Fund. Uh, what's unique about this fund is it, it, it could allow for not just state money, but a lot of private investment as well. We've been seeing in the news quite a few different private entities and companies across California interested in um, helping to try to solve this problem and trying to ensure that that funding is being used in an effective way. This fund would be able to take that in and use it across the state in the most efficient and effective way possible. Um, and that funding is... is um, being proposed right now, so it is not it is still in discussion with the legislature. But the hope would be that that would help folks move into safe and safe and stable permanent housing that is affordable um, for that individual in, individual, as well as supporting the provision of all necessary and appropriate supportive services to wrap around folks. Um, but then also increase the number of permanent housing units. So there is some some expectation that this fund could help add additional units rehab certain places and try to get, get more units online for folks because we know we can't solve this problem without adding housing to adding to the housing stock. So that's sort of the, the broad the broad funding buckets, but there's also some specifics around um, programs that are that are working for um, that can be specifically targeted for our aging Californians and, and our folks with disabilities. So the next slide. 
So just a little bit about the way we we sort of think about the funding. Um, you know, there, there's a range of funding streams that can be used from everywhere from prevention, as I've mentioned, all the way down to, um, you know, the folks that are chronically homeless and have been on the streets for, for quite a while, but that are aging rapidly. And so both of those populations we think are crucial um, populations to be investing in, and, and we have funding that can sort of address both sides of that, of that coin. Um, so as I mentioned, the Homeless Emergency Aid Program, that was that $500 million program from a couple of years ago. That funding is still being uh, spent through next June um, and can be used on a lot of emergency shelters, services, et cetera. Um, the Homeless Housing and Assistance Program I mentioned is just hitting the streets now. The application closes on Saturday um, and can be used for the, that wide range of things I mentioned, including new navigation centers and emergency shelters. Um, our Housing and Disability Advocacy Program is run out of our Department of Social Services, um, and it is really intended to serve chronically homeless individuals who are likely eligible um, for SSI, SSP, or CAPI. Um, so those, those acronyms Kim was talking about earlier in, in the session. Um, it was originally a, a pilot for $45 million, um, sort of a competitive allocation, so not statewide, um, but has recently become an annual allocation. And so that is an expected program to, to stick around for a while um, and really try to, to, to increase the income of folks that are, are experiencing chronic homelessness so that they are able to stay permanently housed um, and get them permanently housed. On the other end of that spectrum is our Home Safe program, also run out of the Department of Social Services. Um, that is a $15 million pilot program um, that is, uh, oh, sorry, just making sure you all could hear me. It sounds like there were some issues. Um, the, that is $15 million, 24 counties, um, that is uh, intended to sort of support the safety and housing stability of individuals involved in the Adult Protective Services Program. It is really intended to, to focus on prevention strategies um, since it is a short-term funding stream. So really, these two programs address those two ends of the spectrum I was, I was mentioning. Um, and then this, this final one that we could be um, seeing, sort of stay tuned as it is discussed in the legislature, is this fund that could be used for everything from board and cares to additional rental units to um, set jalo subsidies for folks that just don't have enough income over a long period of time. And with that, I will hand it back over. Thank you, Allie, for uh, that, that whirlwind tour of all the activity, all the action, all the leadership by our governor and his team uh, and you to respond to the growing homelessness. So grateful for that. We're gonna review the polls and then we'll hand it off to Dr. Cushell in just a second. Great. So thanks again to everyone uh, responding to the polls. During Ali's presentation, we asked three polls, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and report out on them. So the first one that we asked, what is your primary source of income? 81% of folks indicated that uh, they're currently working and income from uh, their employment is their primary source of income. <clears throat> and then coming in at 8%, uh, was retirement savings slash pension slash social security. So thanks for responding to that. The second poll that we asked, what is your largest expense? And coming in really a resounding 88% uh, folks indicated that it's their uh, rent uh, and, uh, or mortgage. Uh, next at 7% was food. Uh, th and then finally, uh, miscellaneous was at 3%. <clears throat> we also heard in the chat box, a couple of folks indicated that utilities, uh, including cable, internet, and phone were uh, a significant expense. The next poll that we asked, have you always had keys to where you're staying? 87% of respondents indicated that yes, they've always had keys to where they're staying. 10% of respondents indicated yes most of the time, and 3% of folks indicated uh, no, and we asked you to tell us in the chat box. So thank you again for responding to those, and uh, please be looking for more as we continue. Yeah, so thank you to those of you who shared your experiences in the chat of being homeless. Uh, we had one commenter who said uh, she did experience homelessness as a teenager, but as an adult, uh, she's always had keys. So thank you for sharing that because certainly homelessness uh, throughout the lifespan is within our, our focus here. 
Uh, there are some questions coming in. I'll remind people before we start, Dr. Koshel, that there will be, um, please have your questions come in at any time in the Q&A and we'll either answer them in an interactive way or share them with our speakers. Um, I'll, uh, uh, Margo, I know you're gonna speak to this, but one of the questions coming is about mental health and homelessness. So just to give you a little tee up, but without further ado, let me please turn over to Dr. Margo Koshel, a national leader and treasurer who's right here in San Francisco with us, a UCSF professor of medicine, director of the UCSF Center for Vulnerable Populations. Dr. Koshel. Thanks so much uh, for having me. I'm gonna talk today a little bit about homelessness in older adults, why it's happening, what happens when people are homeless, and what are the solutions. Next slide, please. So first of all, as you might have known, the homeless population is indeed aging. We found in some work that we published in early 2006 that the proportion of single homeless adults um, oh, greater than or equal to 50 in San Francisco and in fact throughout the nation is aging. In 1990, only 11% of homeless single adults were 50 and older. By 2003, 37% were. And now approximately half of all single adults are 50 and older. Next slide. So we now know that this is a generational effect. My colleague at the University of Pennsylvania, Dennis Culhane, looked at shelter data from across the country and realized that Americans born in the second half of the baby boom, about 1955 to 65, have had an elevated risk of homelessness their whole lives. So when that age cohort was in their early 30s, that was the biggest group of people who were homeless. By the 2000s, when that age group was in their early 40s, the same, 2010, late 40s, early 50s, and now it continues to age. When you think of why that might be, it's important to realize that folks born in the second half of the baby boom have in some ways had much bad luck throughout their lives. They were the second half of a big population group. The first half took many of the jobs, so there were fewer left when they entered the job market. They entered the job market during a recession, and we know that people who enter the job market during a recession never make up their lost income. They were the first group to enter adulthood during a big change in our criminal justice policies so that they got caught up in the era of mass incarceration and perhaps Perhaps most importantly, they were the first age group to enter the housing market um, during a time of a very large retrenchment in federal support for affordable housing. Because of this and more, this age group has been particularly vulnerable. Next slide. We know fundamentally the problem of homelessness is really a problem of lack of deeply affordable housing, or what we call ELI housing, or extremely low income housing. This is housing that is both available and affordable, meaning you can pay for it paying less than 30% of your household income um, for people who make less than 30% of the area median income. We call that population ELI. We know that California California is the second worst state in the nation, where there are only 22 units of housing that are available and affordable for every 100 ELI households in California. The only state that's doing worse than we are is Nevada that has 19. This means that in California, for every 100 households who make less than 20%, 30% of the area median income, there are only 22 units of housing that they could possibly rent and afford. This is why we have such a severe homelessness crisis. Next slide. Next slide, okay, great, thanks. It's important to note as, um, as Ali just talked about, that homelessness is really a racial justice issue. I wanna remind everyone that in this country, housing was a primary means of wealth building. And until relatively recently, there was on the books as part of federal policy, um, legalized and normalized discrimination in home ownership through the process of redlining where there were racial covenants so that black Americans were restricted from living in certain neighborhoods and the banks, it was perfectly legal for them to not rent or not give mortgages to people who lived in the neighborhoods where black Americans were living in or if they gave mortgages to, to charge really high levels. This led to um, a very low proportion of home ownership in the black community and really excluded that community from building wealth 
itself and is a major contribution to the enormous rent, uh, wealth gap between black and white households, estimated to be about 63 times. We also know that black Americans and other communities of color were disproportionately affected by the predatory uh, lending crisis that happened more recently. We know that despite fair housing laws, there's ongoing and well-documented discrimination in the rental market, such that black households wind up paying much more for the same housing as white households do. You add to that very well-documented and well-known discrimination in criminal justice system, in the employment system, and in the educational system, which is of course linked to where you live. And perhaps it's not a surprise that black Americans are at three to four fold risk across the country of homelessness, these numbers may be worse in California. In San Francisco, for example, less than 6% of the population identifies as Black, but 37% of those experiencing homelessness do. In LA, the numbers are 8% compared to 42%. It's going to be very hard for us to make substantive changes in this unless we are open and honest and, and really address the structural racism that is at the heart of this crisis. Next slide. I want to very quickly introduce you to the study that um, from which I um, have the results that I'm going to talk about next. This is a study funded by the National Institute on Aging that we've been conducting since 2013 to 2014 in Oakland when we enrolled 350 participants who are 50 and older, homeless, and English speaking. Um, we follow them every six months, whether or not they remain homeless. We added another 100 participants about two years ago, and we've done this in the partnership with amazing community organizations organizations, um, particularly um, St. Mary's Center, who you heard from before. Next slide. Um, when we look at our population in Hope Home, we know that um, we know that uh, the population all have to be over 50 to be in our study, but as you can see, most were between the ages of 50 and 64. Only 12% of our participants when we enrolled them were 65 and older, and the median age was 57, meaning that half of the participants were between 50 and 57, and the other half between 58 and higher, and the oldest age was 80. Next slide, please. Um, when we looked at um, what was the housing history of people in our study, we found that almost a third of the sample had lost their stable housing in the past year. And by stable housing, I mean one place where they had lived, not an institution, so not a jail or a hospital or anything, for a year or more. When we looked at when we looked out um, when their episode of homelessness began, almost a third had their last first their episode of homelessness start in the prior six months, so had been homeless for less than six months when they entered the study. You can see that almost a third, or 29 percent, had been homeless for more than five years. However, next slide. So, if you remember one thing about this talk, remember this. Everyone in our study had to be 50 and older, and we know that about half of homeless single adults are 50 and older. But amongst those who were 50 and older, 44% had their first episode of homelessness after age 50, meaning that they had never had a moment, even one night of homelessness in their life until they reached the age of 50. Now, we hypothesize that the almost half of people who first became homeless after the age of 50 had some critical differences compared to those who first became homeless before 50, and that, in fact, is what we found. Next slide. So what we found were that the people who became homeless before 50 had life experiences that really fit within what maybe the general public thinks of when they think about people with the experience of homelessness. This was a group of people who had really, really devastatingly difficult childhoods filled with very much trauma and adverse life experiences. Because of this, they really struggled to get a foothold in adulthood, and they had very little income attainment when they entered early adulthood. In general, they never married or partnered. They told us about struggling with mental health problems that started early in their lives, many reports of traumatic brain injury, many had experience in state or federal prison, and many struggled with alcohol use problems. Next slide. 
This is the story of one of our participants who we met in his mid to late 50s, who was talking to us about how he first became homeless when he was a teenager. He told us, my father said, next time, if you run away, I'll beat you with a car chain or I'm gonna throw you at the window. Okay, so I, I wouldn't use the word reasonable, but I put things in perspective real quick and I would say, could I survive a car chain? Probably not. Then I looked out the window and said, and we lived on the 13th floor, I said, I ain't playing with this man. He went to work, I had whatever I had on me, I was out the door. This gentleman fled that abusive household onto the streets and the rest of his life, he didn't get to continue high school, the rest of his life has been marked by all sorts of struggles in and out of the criminal justice system, struggles with mental health and substance use, and here he finds himself in his 50s living on the streets of Oakland. Next slide. Now, those who had the first home episode of homelessness after the age of 50 had different results. They generally had worked their whole lives, although they worked often more than one job, but it was always low wage work that was often very physically demanding. They did this struggling to hold on in deep poverty until after the age of 50 when something happened. And that something was usually one or sometimes more than one of the following. Either they lost their job or their spouse or partner lost their job, their marriage broke up, they became sick, their spouse or partner became sick, their spouse or partner died, or their parent died. We saw all too many people who were living with a parent, either because they had always lived there or because they had moved in to care give. And when that parent died, they were displaced from their housing and found themselves homeless. Next slide. This is a story of one of our participants who was homeless for the first time in his 50s, talking to us about what had happened in the months before he became homeless. When they, a new company, bought the company out, they cut her hours back and they would bring in the temp workers and they would give them all the hours and they weren't giving us our hours, which caused me to lose my place I was staying in because I couldn't afford to pay the rent. Because you know, when you're going from almost 80 to 100 hours a week, that's what he was working to afford his rent. Down to 20 hours a week, it's kind of hard to pay the bills. Next slide. When we think about the older adults in our study, whether or not they were first homeless before or after 50, we found poor health in almost every measure. This is one of the simplest ways that we um, that we measure how people's um, health are, how likely they are to die or wind up in the hospital is we simply ask them how you would rate your health, poor, fair, good, very good, or excellent. What we saw was that in a sample with the median age of 57, who most people were under 65, 56% reported their health as fair or poor. Just for context, the only community in which we see similar numbers are in the frailest elders, 85 and above. Next slide. We found a very high proportion with functional impairments. So almost 40% had a limitation in an activity of daily living, with over half of those had two or more, and 50% with a limitation in instrumental activities of daily living. And I remind you that people who have two or more limitations in activities of daily living are at extremely high risk of requiring nursing home care. Next slide. We found a very high prevalence of cognitive impairment or thinking problems of thinking or memory or judgment. So we saw that over a quarter had markers of impairment in the three MS tests with measures global impairment, things like memory, judgment, et cetera. And um, over a third had problems with executive function. Executive function is the ability to follow sequence commands, or as I like to say, the ability to follow directions like, oh, you wanna get housing? You need to show up at this office on between Monday, Wednesday, and Friday before noon. You need to fill out the paper and bring them to this other office. Those are very hard instructions for people who have an executive function impairment to follow. And yet that is how we design our systems and that is what we demand of our homeless seniors, many of whom will struggle with this. Next slide. There was a very high prevalence of all geriatric conditions, problems with mobility, Almost a third had fallen in the prior six months, almost a half with visual impairment, over a third with hearing impairment, and almost a half with urinary incontinence. Now imagine how difficult it is to find a job or to find housing if you don't have access to bathing or laundry and you struggle with urinary incontinence. Next slide. 
This leads me to say that when we talk about homeless adults, 50 is the new 75. Even though the median age of our sample was 57, the prevalence of geriatric conditions was worse than those in the general population samples in their 70s and 80s. Next slide. Alcohol and drug use problems were common, so about two-thirds had moderate or greater severity of drug use symptoms, with cocaine and cannabis being the most common. A quarter had problems with alcohol use symptoms, 15% had severe symptoms. But I want to also point out that many of our participants explained to us about how when they were homeless, their symptoms got worse because they used it as a way to stay awake or a way to cope with the enormous stress of homelessness. Next slide. We have found exceedingly high mortality in institutional care. Of the 350 participants that we enrolled between 2013 and 2014, we have 51 confirmed deaths. We found eight additional deaths of those recruited last year amongst the 100. And we found that those whose first episode of homelessness was after 50 were twice as likely to have died than those with earlier onset homelessness. We have found over 40 confirmed nursing home stays, and we think that that is an underestimate. Next slide. The majority of people, but by no means all, regain housing. We like to say that homelessness is a state and not a trait. It's an experience that people have. You can see that by 18 months into our study, only 42% remained homeless, although that number stayed about steady over time. I will tell you, interestingly, that those with very long-term homelessness were only slightly less likely to regain housing than those who were newly homeless, meaning that approximately half of people who we found you know, months or days after they entered homelessness for the first time have remained homeless for months to years after that. They basically became homeless and stay, got stuck there. Next slide. So what do we do about this? First of all, the answer to homelessness is housing. It's almost so easy that it defies uh, belief, but it is politically very difficult to do. I want to point out that the housing that we desperately need is housing for extremely low income households, households that make less than 30% of the area median income. We need to dramatically increase, protect, and, and preserve the amount of housing that we have that's affordable to this part of the community. For people with significant behavioral disabilities, people who have substance use and mental health problems, we know how to house them too. What we need is ELI housing with supports that are voluntary, things like mental health treatment, case management, and the like. This has been shown to be extraordinarily effective. Those supports in the housing must be offered on a housing first basis. Housing first simply means that you start with the housing first. You don't demand that people are sober. You don't demand that people enter mental health treatment. You start with the housing and you offer those services on a volunteer basis. People with substance use disorders can and do become housed. And not only should you offer them housing, you must. We need to house people as quickly as possible to limit the enormous trauma from homelessness, and we need to divert people or prevent people from following to homelessness wherever and whenever we can. Next slide. We have not had enough effort on preventing homelessness, and I'm thrilled to see the state engaging this in a meaningful way. For prevention efforts to work, they need to be efficient and effective. So they need to both work and they need to target the people at highest risk. We're seeing some increased action around eviction prevention, although I wanna remind you that it is people who don't have a lease, who've already lost their lease, that, is, uh, that are at the highest risk of homelessness. There's some good models like the home base program in New York. In California, I'm thrilled that we have the Home Safe program, which gives resources for homelessness prevention to our adult protective services workers who are likely to encounter people at high risk. The most bang for our buck or the most important and efficient way to do prevention is actually to target people at the highest risk, even if we think that small amounts won't help them. It turns out it will. Next slide. 
we need to think about rapid rehousing. And I think in, we have an incredible example in Oakland through the Kaiser Back Senior Homelessness Program, um, the Kaiser Permanente and Bay Area Community Services Partner worked together in using a strategy called flexible engagement. They basically offered rapid rehousing to 515 homeless individuals, 50 and older. This is time limited subsidies and services. And what they did was they found that if people were not stabilized, they then moved them into permanent supportive housing. They have used a variety of models, including shared housing. For instance, they bought seven houses for about half a million dollars each and put six unrelated adults into them with some services and have created a permanent affordable housing that way. They've given subsidies for families. Um, they've given subsidies for people to move into apartment and worked on um, increasing people's incomes through things like benefits or getting them back into the workforce. About 15% of the people have been uh, moved into permanent supportive housing because they found that they couldn't stabilize with this less intensive intervention. Next slide. So permanent supportive housing for those with behavioral disabilities really is the answer. What permanent supportive housing is, is subsidized housing that is linked to voluntary supportive services. It has to be given on a housing first model where you start with the housing. It is shown to be very, very highly effective at keeping people with significant disabilities housed. So for instance, in Santa Clara, we help Santa Clara identify their 400 most disabled chronically homeless individuals. These were people with very, very, very significant mental health and substance use disorders. We only had 124 units of housing, so people were randomly selected to be in the program or not be in the program. We found that 85% um, percent of those individuals, despite their very significant disabilities, were able to remain housed for the following few years with 90% of their days housed. However, we really need to adapt permanent supportive housing for the needs of older adults. We really need to figure out how to get long-term supports and services, programs like the in-home supportive services program, into permanent supportive housing. We need to make sure that the architecture is accessible to older adults. We need to make sure that it is staffed appropriately to provide dementia care, to um, create safe environments for older adults. It's extremely important. And there are a few models to do this, such as merging permanent supportive housing with the PACE program, which is there is a trial of this, um, a, a pilot of this going on in San Diego right now, and it's very promising. Next slide. So we face many challenges. The loss of residential care facilities throughout California has created a crisis for people who need a little bit more support. We need to think of creative ways to, for instance, use assisted living waiver through Medicaid to make this happen. We need to think about all the ways that PSH can provide services for the aging population, as I talked about, the provision of personal care, like through PACE, or like through contract models, IHHS programs, like through HomeBridge. We need to make sure that the staffing of those pro uh, programs are available and, and, and know how to do things like advanced care planning, end-of-life caring, and dementia caring. Next slide. So homelessness is reaching crisis proportion with older adults as one of the fastest rising groups. The aging of the population increases the urgency and the suffering is just immense. We know that the use of the healthcare system can be chaotic and while mental health and substance use disorders are common, the underlying causes are structural. We have to adjust systems to respond to the needs of the aging population. Solutions are not gonna be easy but they really are doable. And we need to match the solution to the problem. And remember, at the heart of this, this is a crisis of ELI housing. Thank you so much. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Cashel, and thank you to all of you who were uh, writing in with your uh, response to the barriers. Margo, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit, but I think you can, uh, you can do it with all the questions that have come in. Um, First question for you, are you seeing particular um, impacts on the LGBTQ community? Randy talks about how sometimes that community uh, can experience ostracism from their family. Uh, what do you see uh, showing up in homelessness among the LGBTQ community? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Randy, for bringing that up. Um, and I apologize for not squeezing it into the shorter conversation. The LGBT community and particularly LGBTQ elders, or frankly, LGBT community at any age group 
is at particularly high risk. And what we see, for instance, is a community who has often been ostracized from family, so they don't have the support of family. We see many people, particularly in the older adults, who were in long-term committed relationships, but because they came of age in a time where there wasn't legal marriage, <coughs> they are not eligible for a spouse or partner's benefits if that spouse or partner passes. Um, we see a community that often, frankly, faces um, ostracism in, um, in uh, programs for homeless seniors where they don't feel like they fit in. And a final thing I will say is many people are solving their homelessness by moving to lower cost, more rural communities. And we see many members of the LGBTQT community who don't feel comfortable leaving a place that has been a place of sanctuary for them. And so for this and many other reasons, we see dramatically increased risk of homelessness in members of the LGBTQ community. Thank you. And two data questions that either, um, if you have the answer, great. And if not, we can follow up with you. Bill was very interested in your generational uh, chart and wondered about the economic crisis, the Enron, the financial crisis of 2008, 9, and 10. Does that have a particular impact on elders and homelessness? Yeah, that is a great question. We know that that crisis really, um, particularly, frankly, in communities of color, caused a massive loss of wealth and also and also caused um, and also caused problems, uh, particularly for um, the older population, many of whom saw their life savings wiped out. So we think that that crisis, both in leading to the foreclosure crisis and also just as it wiped out many people's retirement savings caused a huge crisis for many age groups but I agree I think it hit the older adults harder because they had less time for instance to rebuild it hit them right as they were entering retirement so it left them less ability to sort of regroup and rebuild up a retirement nest egg so it certainly had caused people to lose um, housing that through the foreclosure crisis which by the way not only impacted homeowners but impacted renters who were living in houses that were foreclosed on but also the loss of wealth and we know that it's not just income but it's wealth that can serve as a protection had a huge crisis so yeah we think it did and one last data question if you could comment on the difference uh, between the experience of people maybe in their 50s 60s, 70s, and even 80 plus in experiencing homelessness? Yeah, you know, I think we're going to see more and more older folks. So um, Dennis Culhane just modeled that actually the fastest growing group of people experiencing homelessness are those 65 and older, in large part because of this cohort effect, that that population is expected to triple um, be between now and 2030. Um, it sort of goes both ways. Obviously, as people get older, they get frailer in general. Um, we also see a little bit of what we might call a survival bias, that the fewer people who are able to survive to those older ages when they're homeless may be people who... Um, maybe people who are in particularly good health. But there's no question that I think the problems that we see are only going to become more exacerbated as this age cohort continues to be at risk. And I anticipate that in a few years, we're going to be talking about this more as a crisis in people 60 and over. And we're certainly seeing more and more people who are older. No question that the older people are, the more likely and the higher the risk of some of these um, geriatric conditions and other crises are. Thank you for that. What a, what a call to action that is for the master plan for aging. Uh, I do want to share out that in response to the question about the greatest barrier to housing people who are unhoused, uh, overwhelmingly people said in many different ways, housing, housing, and housing, uh, nimbyism, racism, classism, the difficulty of building ELI housing uh, with services, the lack of affordable housing specifically for seniors, for multi-generational, uh, not enough supply. It just the, the, the stream of comments uh, on this uh, is, is overwhelming that, that the, the need for local communities to build housing, to meet the community's needs and overcome those kind of traditional NIMBY barriers. Uh, I, I could be reading comments all, all day uh, about that. Uh, people also shared that there's wait lists for the housing that is available, that low SSI, SSP grants don't allow people to cover the rents. Um, and then the need for interventions right before falling into homelessness, that there's an opportunity there to prevent 
that is being uh, missed too often. Uh, gentrification comes up, uh, uh, questions about evictions, how evictions are not uh, um, mindful of the intersection with homelessness. Um, and of course, uh, a, a theme that's come up all too often in our webinars, ageism. Let's move to our very wise stakeholder advisory committee members who will um, bring this all together with recommendations and solutions. As you know, we have a 34 member stakeholder committee with lots of experience and expertise. They are reviewing the public comments that have come in through our website and the recommendations that have come in. We have research subcommittee looking at data. We have a new equity work group meeting tomorrow to make sure that we are truly building a plan with uh, equity and uh, aging well for all. And they'll be bringing back what they've heard today from all of you and from our experts to the full stakeholder advisory committee in May for consideration. So, so grateful to Janie and Kevin for bringing it all together. With that, here's Janie Castillo from St. Mary's Center. Uh, thank you, Director Wade. Let me check to make sure I'm coming through. Loud and clear. Beautiful. So, of course, I want to thank Governor Newsom and Secretary Galley and everyone at the Capitol and throughout the state that have jumped into deep waters to help us develop the Master Plan for Aging. I'm grateful for a seat at the table representing St. Mary's Center Extremely Low Income Seniors. I can testify that this committee does not steer away from the difficult, complicated conversations as a matter of fact, we welcome them. This webinar series is a testament to the sincere attempt to honor the process. It is a window into our best thinking and more importantly, into a process that welcomes your input. I want to extend a special thank you to uh, Deputy Secretary Sutton and Prof Professor Kushel and her team. Within her pages of the study are seniors that I have the privilege of knowing personally. Today's subject is poverty and homelessness which is in almost every city in California, which has reached extraordinary epidemic proportions. The common sense recommendations I share with you today are a drop in the bucket, but hopefully steer us in the direction to a humane, inclusive response to homelessness. One that, like Professor Kusher says, gets our seniors off the streets quickly and permanently. We've broken up the recommendations into four categories, and the first one is prevention. The first two recommendations to expand rent and eviction prevention assistance programs and strengthen rent control policies are happening at all levels of government in varying degrees. With the governor's executive order and the passing of AB 1482, California is moving in the right direction. We need to keep the momentum going by continuing to pass and enforce fair policy that keeps seniors housed while supporting good landlords. Professor Kushel's report identifies that chronic homelessness is detrimental to the health and well-being of seniors. It worsens their health and shortens their life. I can witness to an increasing number of seniors experiencing crippling pain with moderate to severe mental health illness. One cold winter night, I helped an SMC senior with dementia who was standing by our fence bewildered because he could not find the front door of our shelter. It was really, really a, a really sad experience for us. From Professor Kushel's presentation, we learned that two-thirds of seniors experiencing homelessness for the first time are ages 50 to 55. This data point validates the need to roll back the age limit for senior affordable housing. Right now, 62 is the magic age when most of our units accept applications. Can you imagine the many ways we can reduce suffering by getting more people housed when they are in their 50s versus their 60s? Lastly, we can't build our way out of homelessness, or can we depend on enough money to flow into HUD to answer the need? Until that day, we have a recommendation to create a state subsidy program, more exact, a subsidized in place program, which preserves affordable housing and offers tenant protection. An example of this list is, is like this. A landlord has 10 units with low income tenants. The subsidized in place program can enroll the landlord and the low income tenants into the program, stabilizing landlord income and tenants' rents. Next slide. No matter how much it disturbs us, we will have seniors sleeping outside and in shelters for years to come. Our next set of recommendations speaks to alleviation. 
How do we reduce suffering while homeless? Madeline's stories brings us the need to upgrade our systems so they can be easily navigated by seniors. We also need to create senior-friendly shelters, less cots, less bunk beds, and make sure the site is fully ADA and accessible. A senior-friendly environment could uh, include allowing IHA, IHSS workers to help seniors in shelters. I believe it is allowable, but few are taking advantage of it. Our communities are split in response to encampments, which our outside neighbors would like us to consider calling them informal settlements or curbside communities. The recommendation calls for upgrades, providing them with electricity, waste management systems, hygiene, and water, along with health and human services. And above all, land, land where they may stay with community standards created by residents that include our house neighbors' input. The important point in number three is not that we expand the number of shelter and transitional beds. We all know we need to do that quickly and creatively. The difference is that we build in viable permanent exits into permanent housing. Next slide. So that leads us into our next category, which is permanence. Study after study raises the fact that one of the primary solutions to homelessness is permanent supportive housing. We need to increase political will, write good legislature, increase funding, and the reduce the cost to build and create units. And we could do that. You know, it's not impossible. To respond to the severity of the long-term effects of senior homelessness, we need to expand IHSS, create thousands of assisted living and board care units across our state. And finally, the state subsidy program recommended in our prevention category can also include programs specific for seniors experiencing homelessness. At the federal level, we have VASH, whose expansion to help reduce veteran homelessness. Why can't California create a subsidized program for seniors? As you can see, we have left plenty of space for more recommendations. But before we sign off to speak to the final category, economic and food security, I'd like to introduce you to my fellow committee member and executive director of Justice and Aging, Kevin Prenville. Next slide. Well, uh, thank you so much, Jenny. Um, I want to echo your appreciation of uh, Director Wade and Secretary Galley and the governor and the entire administration for their commitment to the master plan for aging and in particular a commitment to addressing these difficult issues that we've been discussing today. I also want to thank Janie for her incredible work and partnership and Madeline for her leadership and her advocacy um, and all the seniors at St. Mary's and across the state that are giving voice um, to these critical issues. I, I'm going to cover a couple more recommendations that we've uh, gotten feedback from the community on and been working on. Um, but I also want to just take a step back and reiterate some of the context that we started the webinar with, which is that um, you know, California has one of the highest rates of senior poverty in the country. Uh, the, the official federal poverty rate for California is about 10%, but under the supplemental poverty measure, um, almost twice as many seniors are living in poverty, so about 20%. And that's among the highest of any state in the country. And that's just looking at these more official poverty measures. If we really look at economic insecurity through the California Elder Index that, uh, that Kim reviewed at the beginning of the webinar, about one in four seniors is living below the basic need level across the state. And as was reviewed, the disparities exist, that there's real serious and significant disparities about who in our state is aging into poverty. Uh, women of color are more likely to age into poverty because of a lifetime of inequities they face based on gender and race. Sexism and racism uh, that they've experienced throughout their life limits their access to educational, employment, and as you heard um, Dr. Cushell discuss, housing and home ownership opportunities. Also the way that we've devalued the essential work that many women of color uh, traditionally perform in our economy. These all lead to um, these great disparities in who is um, growing old in poverty. So the master plan has to include a broad goal for reducing senior poverty and improving elder uh, economic security. So Janie outlined a lot of the strategies that we can implement to particularly address the resulting homelessness uh, that is so connected to the high poverty rates that we have in California. And I'm gonna cover a couple of others. Um, one that's not here on the slide, 
first is, is just to uh, reiterate the importance of the Outer Economic Security Index. We have this wonderful tool in California to really understand um, just how far below the basic needs level that so many of our seniors are living. And we should use that tool as we uh, plan programs, develop programs, measure uh, those programs. So we really need to be better uh, leveraging uh, what we know from the Elder Economic Security Index. So the, the, the first uh, kind of big recommendation here is one that we've been working on with a wide coalition of advocates from across the state called Californians for SSI. This includes all kinds of service providers. It also includes many individuals um, that are living on SSI um, themselves. And it, and it comes down to needing to restore the state supplemental payments um, that is part of the SSI program in California. So Kim had outlined just what the SSI program is. It's a federal program that provides a very minimal cash benefit to older adults and people with disabilities whose incomes fall below a very low threshold. Um, and then the SSP, the state supplemental payment, is a state payment on top of that federal grant amounts. There's 1.2 million seniors and people with disabilities who receive SSI today. The benefit level is just about $940 per month, which is well below the federal poverty level. And, and of course, even further below the California Elder Index. The SSI, SSP used to be effectively higher, but the state supplemental payment was cut during the recession and um, has not been restored. So if we really want to uh, address senior poverty and address the related impact on homelessness and hunger, we need to restore the supplemental poverty, uh, the, the supplemental payment that the state makes to SSI. So the Californians for SSI Coalition is calling um, for the state to increase the SSI SSP grant amounts to reflect the real cost of living for seniors using the California Elder Index as a guide. And then a second recommendation is once the grant amount has been increased, we need to keep up with the rising cost of housing, food, and other basic needs by instituting a permanent and mandatory cost of living adjustment to the SSP that should be calculated based on the full SSI SSP grants. As uh, Dr. Kushel talked about, uh, housing being the most obvious solution to address homelessness, uh, providing people with income is the most obvious solution to addressing poverty. So this is really critical. Running short on time here, but just quickly, uh, another important area where we see the impact of senior poverty is on uh, rising rates of senior, of senior hunger across California. About 40% of Californians age, 40, age 60 and older are food insecure. That's a 21% increase in the last 15 years. It's, it's it, similar to homelessness, it's, it's the part of the California population that's seen uh, the greatest increases in uh, food insecurity. So we can take steps to reduce those rates of senior hunger um, by investing in and increasing enrollment in current senior nutrition programs. So uh, one of those that, that uh, Director Wade touched on at the beginning of the webinar was the CalFresh program. Um, groups of advocates are working on very particular recommendations for how we can commit to really meeting maximum enrollment in those programs um, through a wide variety of strategies. Um, and then there's also many other senior nutrition programs that were outlined at the beginning, such as Meals on Wheels and Congregate Meals um, that can really be enhanced and leveraged. We can increase the capacity of those programs conduct performance and gap analysis of those programs, allow those programs to truly be integrated into our healthcare systems and covered under Medicare and Medicaid plans. So there's a wide variety of strategies that can be employed once we make the commitment as a state to address senior poverty, homelessness, and hunger. So thank you for giving us a chance to talk about this today. And thank you to the close to 200 of you who are sending in your solutions. Uh, Similar to our housing uh, webinar two weeks ago, one of the major threads is just more housing, senior housing, affordable housing, accessible housing, more, more, more. But an equally important thread is innovation. We need more models, multiple models, Nancy V says, shared living, assisted living waivers, Medi-Cal support for housing, board and care, piloting new models, housing trusts, villages of small houses, just more flexibility, creativity, innovation, 
and, and getting that housing jump started. There's also a recognized need for better public education so more folks have a context for the housing and homeless, homelessness crisis and can see these solutions. A call for better private corporate partnerships, things like taxing corporations for new jobs to help pay for the new housing. And of course, lots of voices coming in. You need income to pay rent, uh, need SSI, SSP to be, be at least somewhere, some uh, a relationship to the rents that people have to pay. Uh, similar coming in on food insecurity, uh, lots of ideas about innovation and expansion, uh, whether it's food donations, the food programs, um, new creativity in serving um, older adults in multiple settings. So we will have lots of recommendations to gather up and bring to our stakeholder advisory committee. We are so grateful to all of you who sent them here, sent them earlier, and will continue to advocate throughout this process. In my remaining 30 seconds, I want to invite you to please come back. In the coming weeks, we will be doing emergency and disasters next week, followed by isolation, inclusion, and respect, preventing and responding to abuse and neglect, making sure our parks and community spaces are accessible and engaging for across the lifespan, and civic and social engagement, again, tying to that purpose and volunteerism across our lifespan. All information about past, future, and present Wednesday webinars is at our new website, engageca.org. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your partnership in helping us make this plan as innovative and bold uh, and ultimately housing all Californians. Thank you.